If you have a D by your name as a Democrat or an R by your name as a Republican, you're on one side or the other. You're the enemy or you're the friend. That's wrong. That's not how I look at things. Never have. People know me is looking at that's Joe from West Virginia. If you make a mistake because you're trying to blame somebody on the other side and you could care less about the problem you have, all you can do is politically identify someone else at fault to make yourself look better, then you shouldn't be involved in public service. That's self-service. That's not public service. Government should be your partner, not your provider. If you think government is going to do everything for you, then basically, I'm sorry. I'm not going to vote that way, and I don't. I vote basically for you to have all the opportunity to be everything that you desire to be, but you've got to make an effort too. Welcome to The Good Government Show. I'm Dave Martin. And on this episode, we have a very special conversation with West Virginia's Senior Senator Joe Manchin. As I said on this show, I had the pleasure to visit West Virginia last year and reported on two stories. I found the stories there and what's going on in the state fascinating. And all the folks I met are really committed to West Virginia. As a result of my story on a program bringing young people back to McDowell County, I got to meet and talk with former West Virginia First Lady Gail Manchin, and she was kind enough to connect me to her husband, Senator Joe Manchin. In a very evenly divided Senate, Senator Manchin has strived for unity and bipartisan support, and that's made him one of the most important voices in the Senate. He hasn't always gotten bipartisan support, and at times he's come under fire for trying to do it but he certainly stays true to his own set of values, and you're going to hear all about that. He's a strong supporter for his home state, and even in the Senate, he continues to put West Virginia at the top of his priority list. So join me for a conversation with Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. The Good Government Show is sponsored by NACO. That's the National Association of Counties. County government is actually the oldest form of government in the United States, and it touches more people directly. Roads, highways, hospitals, schools, recycling, law enforcement, water and sewers. In most of the country, those services are maintained by the county, that's county government. NACO is a nationwide organization that represents all 3,069 counties across the USA. NACO helps county government work better together through things like sharing best practices. Because when county government works well, well, that's just good government. Welcome to the Good Government Show. I'm your host, David Martin, and we are very honored to have as our guest today, Senator Joe Manchin of my new favorite state, West Virginia. Uh, As you know, I visited West Virginia and it was a really uh, eye-opening experience for me. So I really appreciated your state and uh, everybody that I met and talked to down there. So that's great, David. It was. was. It's my favorite state, too. I bet. I I was born and raised there. Is it almost heaven? It really is. I tell you, you know, and the people really make it, uh, the, it takes it the rest of the way to heaven is the people. So uh, I think the beauty of the good Lord gave us and also the resources that we have, and but also the people that basically call that home, whether they have born and raised like I was or whether they smart enough to move there. But it's just a great place. It's, you know, centrally located. It's just great. A lot of good things and a lot of good people make it a wonderful state to live I in. I think as someone said, you never meet a stranger in West Virginia. Never. Never. I've told him. I told him this. If you're ever driving through our state, my great state of West Virginia, and you happen to have a flat tire breakdown, before five minutes, someone will be under your car trying to fix it for you. I I, I have to tell you, Senator, I did get a few stares with my New York license plates. So, like, who are you? But, uh, you know. They, they want to make sure you're not invading the state. They want to make sure you just, <laughs> you're just you there to enjoy the good state. So they would have been the They'd have been the first to come to your aid if you needed it. All right. Let me, let me just go through your background a little bit because you have a long record in politics. Uh, mm-hmm. You were... Uh, Correct any of this if I'm wrong. You were first elected to the West Virginia, the House of Delegates, which is the uh, House of Representatives version of of West Virginia. You were a state senator. Uh, You were secretary of the state from 2000 to 2004. Uh, You were elected governor. uh, And then you won a special election uh, to the Senate. Uh, And so this is your third term as state senator, uh, as U.S. senator? Yes. Okay. I I finished out out the uh, uh, Robert C. Byrd's term. His term ran through 2012. He passed away June of 2010. I thought I could have appointed somebody as governor to finish out my second term as governor, which I enjoyed very, very much. Uh, But then we were found uh, that that would not happen because he died outside of the constitutional window. So I had a decision. And now you're the senior senator from West Virginia. 
Correct. All right. Uh, and in the in the U.S. Senate, you're chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and you're on the uh, Senate Committee for Appropriations, the Senate Committee for Armed Services, and the Committee on Veterans Affairs. Correct. Does that keep you busy? Very much so. And the reason I'm on those committees, when Jay Rockefeller, when I came here after Bob, Senator Burr's uh, passing, uh, Senator uh, Rockefeller was on a f- few other committees, uh, different than that, like Commerce. He was chairman of Commerce at the time, and okay. he'd been around for quite some time. Okay, And then I knew that the veterans and armed services was something that I wanted to make sure that West Virginia was represented properly and had a voice. So I said, we have... You know, concerning uh, population, I have more veterans per capita than most any state. So it's a tremendous concern. Are the veterans being treated the way they should be and get the care they're supposed to get? And also the admiration that we should all have for a person who wore a uniform trying to basically defend and protect me and all of us. So I got on that committee. I think we've been very, very effective on that committee. I've been on armed services to understanding the military and also what the National Guard in West Virginia has to offer to the military. Okay. So I did that in appropriations, and then energy is a natural for me. Now being chairman really elevates that. Um, now, uh, let's have a f- complete disclaimer here. The only reason I know, the only reason you're here is because I had the pleasure of speaking with your wife last year, uh, Gail Manchin, on a program called Reconnecting McDowell. Um, went down to uh, McDowell County talked to some teachers, uh, drove all around the county and a lot of Southern, uh, Southern West Virginia. Um, how is it going? Uh, can you give us a quick update on what's going on down there? Yeah, well, first of all, David, give, give yourself much more credit than that. You did such a great <laughs> job. And basically you were open-minded about, and you were trying to find answers and look at basically evaluating what that area has been to this country and the energy it's produced to what it is today. And we have a responsibility and obligation to try to help them lift themselves back up. So that's what we're sure. doing continuously. That's reconnecting McDowell. Well, you can only reconnect if you have educated, literate people that basically are having an opportunity. And that's what uh, the whole education uh, movement is down there. Gail's been a driver of that ever since I was governor and she was first lady. Right. And she got very much involved and she got sick and tired of seeing a, a state or a county in a state that was taken over because of poor education attainment, but nothing ever changed. That's when she kicked in and tried to make something happen. She is truly the person who said, wait a minute, I can make this better. Absolutely. Yeah. She was the one, she drove it all. And then she got a hold of Randy Weingarten and the deal was done. And the rest is history. Um, That's exactly. Now, I was in downtown Welch and I was with a guy named Cliff Moore, who you may remember from the House of Delegates. I know Cliff extremely well. <laughs> so the Best of the best. So every time we're... His dad, his, hey, Cliff's dad and I served together, Ernie. Did you? And I served in the House of Delegates 1982. So every time we're, Cliff and I are, are out... We were driving around through McDowell and through the area. He's like, look, David, you could buy that house. Look, you could buy that house. And I have a, <laughs> I have, I have a sailboat that I, uh, I sail here in, in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And he's like, look, there's a river. You could put a boat in there. You could put, look at there. There's a boat right over there. <laughs> so he, tr- he did his best trying to get me to move to West Virginia. Well, let me tell you, Cliff is the ultimate salesman. Yes. But what he said to me was when we were standing in downtown Welsh was, you don't understand. He goes, when I was a kid, when I came down here, you couldn't walk on the sidewalk. That, and he pointed to a rest. He said, see that place? That used to be a nightclub. I was there every Friday night. This place was hopping. Um, and I know that what they wanted to do with the Renaissance Village was to make it an anchor for downtown Welsh. Uh, right. Just curious, how is that going? Doing well. You know, they have now they have a movie theater there. They have yes. now eateries there coming back. And they have businesses, the retail uh, lower end of the building they built. It's the first new building for I don't know how many years in McDowell County, but right in the center of Welch. And it gives us a chance. They've cleaned up quite a bit. They're ready to go. We just need some opportunities. And now West Virginia has been a heavy lifter all its life. We've made, produced the energy and some of the finest coking coal that made the steel that built the guns and ship came right. from that county. This is, that's coal town, right? That is it. And let me tell you, there's an awful lot more they have to offer there. We just have to make sure that we can show how to diversify and not lose the culture they've had forever. Speaking of diversify, so have you made it down for the Coal Town uh, barbecue cook-off yet? I have not. All right. Well, it's on I've my list. There, no, I've been there before, but you mean, no, not recently. It, it's certainly on my list, and I, th- and I see they got a new sponsor, so I guess it's going well. I hope so. I'm going to tell you, I've been there so many times in so many events, and you know they have one of the biggest veterans parades that in the whole area. I mean, it's unbelievable. Is it? Some of the things. And you know, the Rocket Boys came from that area. Yes. Cole, uh, Homer uh, Hickam. Homer, right. Homer Hickam, all the books. 
Yes, yes, yeah. yes. A couple of uh, we had actually we had the same book agent for a little while. Um, yeah, and that's uh, what, well, I'm sorry. The name of the town is Colville, Colton, Coltown. Coltown. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, just yeah. just a little bit west and north of Welsh, correct? Yeah, it's right. It's right. It's the same county. That's where some of the uh, uh, some of the best quality it seems of coal came from, as far as the high coking coal for making steel. And it was something, uh, really something. So let me just impress you slightly, if I can, with my with my West Virginia bona fides. I spent some time in McDowell uh, working on the on uh, reporting on the McDowell re- reconnecting the McDowell issue. I went over to Boone County where they have the lavender farm there. Um, this mm-hmm. this year, I've talked to the hey David. That was Colwood. I said Cold Town. Colwood. It was Colwood. 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 Thank Colwood. You. All right, we, we have a fact checker right Colwood. behind you. Good. Yep. <laughs> I wanted to make sure, but I knew. All right. Yeah. We- um. Well, next trip, um, I spoke to the uh, county commissioners from Mercer County and uh, Tammy Tincher from Greenbrier County um, recently. Um, and so I've done a little bit of research in what's going on in West Virginia. And I guess the thing that everybody keeps talking about is the changing economy in West Virginia from a coal economy to a diversified economy. Um, so from your spot, uh, both as a longtime resident, uh, born and raised in West Virginia and a, and a public official there, now on the national level, how are you helping that process? Well, the bottom line, in 2020, we started for the first time having energy, an energy bill that myself and Lisa Murkowski, uh, at that time, we passed a piece of legislation, which is the Energy Act, first time in 13, 13 years, I think, that we had a truly energy bill. She comes from Alaska, a very rich energy place. I come from West Virginia, one of the highest production as far as energy. But we know the diversification, which we say it's an all-in energy policy. Use all you have. We have an abundance of natural gas in West Virginia. We have the ability and the workforce that can acclimate to about anything you can throw at them. We know that hydrogen is something that's coming on. We are open-minded now to small modular reactors, nuclear, if you will, in areas that basically can continue to produce and ship the power that needs to be used around around the country. We have the grid system in place. We've got everything in place because we industrialized many, many years ago, 100 years ago. We're building railroads and here, there, and everywhere else. Yeah. So the transportation's here. We can do so much. And if you look at our state, we're right in the middle of about two-thirds of the population of the United States, right in the middle within one day's drive. So we're centrally located to really continue to be the energy hub. But you have to be open-minded, David. If, if you want to stick in the past, you can't. We can't change the market. So as coal basically becomes less and less of an energy factor of what production of energy f- for the country. Yes. Basically, there's other prop, uh, purposes for coal. But the rest of the world is demanding more coal coming from West Virginia than ever before. So the coal <laughs> mines are as busy as can be. But the demand's there. But now we have the Marcellus shell. We have the Utica shell. We have the wet properties. We have a cracker coming. We have all these things happening. We have a chemical valley. We've been there for many, many years. And now we're able to use all of those to our advantage again, to diversify and reinvent ourselves. And also to be able to do it in a much more environmentally conscious, cleaner way. But David, you cannot eliminate your way to a cleaner environment. You can innovate it, but not eliminate it. Well, I want to ask the, you about that because a the recent country needs force power. Sorry. A recent US UN report came out that said that we are very close to a tipping point uh, with climate change in the world. Um, shouldn't we be doing everything immediately to get off of fossil fuel burning coals? Hey, uh, the bottom line is you have yeah. seven, eight hundred million people have no energy at all in the world. Okay. Different parts. The energy, India is just basically becoming energized, okay? And the demand's there. <laughs> right. China will not take its foot off the pedal. They're building more and more fossil fuel plants than ever before in the history of the world and more demand. So the only way you're going to basically be able to have any of those countries follow, because they're say, well, you built your the greatest industrial might in the world and the greatest economy and the greatest middle class, basically off of the energy you had. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to basically restrict me? I don't think so. So what you need to do is incentivize them to use the cleanest of technologies. That's why I say you can innovate your way. You need scrubbers, low NOx boilers, bag houses for mercury, carbon capture. You need all of those things. If they're going to still use the coal, we can use it in a cleaner fashion and show them how to do it. You know, I remember growing up and you couldn't hang, mom couldn't hang the laundry out. That's changed completely. We have transformed in the last 20 years and not gotten an iota of credit because people want to eliminate 
and keep using West Virginia as a whipping boy. That's wrong. We can be the leaders of innovation, and that's what we're doing, David. And also, we're open-minded to all different forms. But we're, David, I will not go down the path that Europe has gone down. I will not go down the path where people says you got to charge carbon pricing. You got to put a carbon tax on everything that's made that's used carbon and penalize. David, that's what Europe did and hasn't fixed a thing. We've incentivized with the Inflation Reduction Act, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Okay. The things that we have done is now showing the incentives are working and basically the taxes did not work. So I think you're seeing so much innovation coming to West Virginia, battery factories now. We have new steel companies coming with a better, cleaner version of how they can make their steel using uh, new technology. All these things are happening because we are innovating and not eliminating. Let's talk about something that's a a whole different kind of innovation. And that's one of the things that everybody talked to me about when I was in West Virginia, which is tourism. Um, Specifically, uh, I think the New River Gorge is the most recent national forest in the nation. National Park. National National Park Park and and Preserve. Right. Um, Did you have a hand in that? And and how did that come up? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, myself and and my counterpart, Shelly Capito, we led and got that done. We found it on the Energy Committee. We wrote it. Our energy committee, David Brooks, and who's basically been here for 30 years and understands more about public lands, the BLM, the park system and all that. We wrote that bill and, and working with Shelly and I together, we waited for the opening. We had an opening and if there was a time we could put it in and we did and it passed overwhelmingly. And now it is basically exceeding everyone's expectation. Now we've got to get water and sewer. I'm fighting for extending the water and sewers program there to meet the demand of people coming in. That was something that someone mentioned to me in, in uh, Greenbrier County. It's getting done. That's going to get done, Dave. Um, what is the huge benefit for New River Gorge for the people of West Virginia and the United States? Well, basically, it, puts you, it literally puts you on the map when people are checking off. There's people that travel around, and they want to make sure they've, they've gone to every national park in the nation. Yes. The newest one being the closest one to the majority of the people in the United States is going to be the one – that we even we didn't anticipate the flood of people coming. And like yourself, finding out about the quality of life, the good people we have, the beautiful scenery, the good Lord's given us everything, David. Now, it's like we've been, well, ever since COVID too, that we have been rediscovered. Well, I was sitting at a bar in Beckley and I was sitting there, there were three or four people there. And I said, you know, hi, I'm from New York. I'm here to do some reporting on West Virginia. What's going on? And I was, again, I was in Beckley and everyone mentioned the new New River Gorge. Like, oh, you got yeah, to come to the park. You got to come. You got to do this. You got to do that. Well, yeah. we're expanding. We have the Bechtel Center, which is the Boy Scout Center, one of the largest. It is their home base for the whole Boy Scouts, United States of America. 10,000 acres on the most beautiful piece of property they have developed to one of the most scenic things. And also participation wise there. Everything that we're able to. But that part of our state has so much natural beauty, rock climbing, if you like rock climbing, river rafting, some of the best river rafting in the country is right right in that area. Yeah, I'm not walking over that big high bridge. I'm not doing that, sorry. Well, you can go through the catwalk. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll tether you and everything. So if you fall, you'll dangle. No, no okay. heights. No heights. I'll do, I'll, I'll stay close to the ground. Like well, I said, that one's a, I have yeah, a boat. That's a good. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because we've been talking with lots of people at the local level, we haven't really spoken with a lot of people on this show yet at the national level where you are. So you sort of wear two hats. You wear your West Virginia hat and also, you know, a, a United States senator. Is it hard to balance those two? Because sometimes the needs of West Virginia aren't the same as the needs of the United States. And sometimes the needs of the greater United States aren't, the, you know, don't answer the needs of West Virginia. How do you manage that? And how do you balance that act? I try to keep it from getting politicized and everything's been politicized. You've been identified now. If you have a if you have a D by your name as a Democrat or an yeah. R by your name as a Republican, you're on one side or the other. You're the enemy or you're the friend. That's wrong. That's not how I look at things. Never have. People know me is looking at that's Joe from West Virginia. Yeah. The bottom line is our, our state, David, has everything. We have the most uh, on a population standpoint, percentage wise, more veterans per capita than about any state. So I don't have to worry. OK, what hat do I have on? I only have one hat on. That's all encompassing West Virginia and America in the same because we produce the energy the countries need. We're an energy exporter. So we base energize the line that people enjoy every day for okay. the power they need. We do that. We've been able to, to make the steel 
and, and everything else that it takes as far as the industrial might this country has needed. And then so when I'm looking at things, it says, well, how would we do it in West Virginia? Because I think it's all American. We're the Americana <laughs> city. We're the Americana state. If, if, and I've always said this. If my country does well, my state will do just great because we contribute so much to the well-being of our country. I feel good about that. And it's very easy for me not to worry about the politics and worry about the process that we're doing and the progress that we're making. Well, you you, you talk about not worrying about the politics. Um you know, you have a very political job, however, and, you know, your name gets in the papers. Um, sure. You know, you've mentioned, uh, you've talked a lot about bipartisanship, that that is something that you strive for every day. Um, I've talked with people um, around the nation, and one of the things that they've said, especially at the local level, is if you're a Republican and you're seen talking with Democrats, then you get it from one side. And if you're a Democrat and you are talking with Republicans, you know, is bipartisanship even truly possible. I mean, look at what's going on in the U.S. Senate. I mean, is it well, look, look at the look at the one seventeenth Congress There's the last two years, 20 to 22. We got more accomplished than ever in the history of the country. Yes. OK, because we had to. We were the most divided Congress that we've ever had for that period of time in the history of 240 years. OK, so it's either big reality sets in. You've got to do something. I, that's the thing, David, I'm not identified as a politician. I never wanted to be a politician. <laughs> I just wanted to fix things. Okay. You happen to get in there and you get identified. And up until I came to Washington, I never knew a Republican I didn't like. It wasn't my friend. Okay. Okay. And still yet to this day, I don't look at just because you have an R or D. Then people says, well, things are changing. But a lot you of people are. But a lot of people are looking at it that way. A lot of people it. aren't. It's a shame because you know why? It's the media keeps driving and driving and driving. They keep pushing and pushing and showing the sensational. And they said, remember the old theory of if it bleeds, it reads. <laughs> Please, now, it so basically, right? yeah, if you're if you're if, if, if you're uh, just sensational and say something absolutely cra- uh, crazy, uh, then people, oh, yeah, I feel that way, too. I'm mad as hell, too. So I'll do this and do that. I just don't do that. I'm not going to incense and, and, and infuriate people. I said, listen, we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. But if you if you make a mistake, uh, honestly, trying to make things better and fixing things, you can live through that. You can go back and have another day to correct it. If you make a mistake because you're trying to blame somebody on the other side and you could care less about the problem you have, all you can do is politically identify someone else at fault to make yourself look better. Then you shouldn't be involved in public service. That's self-service. That's not public service. That sounds good. Now, one of the things we've heard about from lots of folks, uh, again, um, at the county level, county government level, is that you need to be present and you need to be engaged. Um, has spending half of your time in, in Washington, is that hard to maintain? Yeah. It's, you, you feel, well, you, you know, here we are in our age and everything, and you feel like you're still in college again, going back and forth when you can back home. Okay. And packing up and everything. Just, just it's, it's, it's so inefficient and it's not effective. What we should be doing here, David, we should be here three weeks straight through full work weeks, Monday through Friday, three weeks, and then one week back home in your home state. Right now, every weekend, people, Thursday afternoon at 2.30, they're jumping on a jet going somewhere in the world or in their country or back to their state. Well, think of the poor people, the senators and Congress people that live out west. That's a tremendous, how much time and effort, and look at the cost the taxpayers are incurring on that. And then on the other hand, we don't get to know each other because we're never here to say, Hey, this weekend, can you get your wife? We'll have dinner together and let's do this or bring the kids over. We don't do any of that. Well, that's you, a, really you, know, got- you bring up an interesting point. I, I worked for CBS News for many, many years. And I there was a gentleman who worked there for a very long time and said that one of the problems they have now is that everybody's leaving to go home on the weekend and do fundraising. And, and yeah. as a result, we don't know each other. And back in the old days, Tip O'Neill and Bob Dole would be off in a corner with a, with a cocktail sitting by themselves and work out a deal and come Monday morning, they would hammer something out. And now it's at a point where they don't know each other. Is that, is that fair? And, and, and how do we get good government back? You're completely accurate on that. But the bottom line is, is that uh, the citizens of this great country are being forced to pick a side. They're being forced to go to your corners and defend it. They're not basically being incentivized to basically come together and let's fix it. We've got a lot of challenges. You've got inflation, Serious. Okay. You've got basically a border security situation, which is out of control, the border. Mm -hmm. You've got basically a worker shortage problem, 
when you cannot fill nine, 10 million jobs, even this much time after the COVID pandemic is over, you got all these things hitting you right now. You got geopolitical unrest around the world. You got Russia and China, major threats, nuclear power, major threats. You've got all of this and you're trying to maintain and balance it. Well, the bottom line is, first of all, you have to be energy independent to be a superpower of the world. You have to have enough confidence in the finances of your country for people to look at us as the leader of the free world by having the reserve currency being the U.S. dollar. You lose that, David. You've lost all the all the clout that you have and all the might that you might need to hold the free world together. And if you're not able to produce and help your allies around the world with energy when they become less uh, self-sufficient, and if you're not able to use the might of your finances, so we have a runaway debt has to be controlled. Get your finances in order. You, anybody listening and watching what we're talking about now, if they have unmanaged debt, if they for 21 years in a row spent more money than they took in, Dave, yeah. you wouldn't be sitting there and I wouldn't be sitting here. True. And that's what's happened in this country. And no one's talking about that. No one's talking about the, the basically the, 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 the choking and life-threatening debt that we're facing as a nation to have confidence that the United States has its act together financially. So I read somewhere in your in your bio on your webpage that you held 500 meetings last year with uh, different people in West Virginia around the state. Just curious, what are those people telling you when you meet with them? The same thing. They just want opportunities. That's all. They're not looking for a handout. The main thing I would tell you, and you ask me, what about what's government's main purpose, Dave? Yes. Is to be the best partner you've ever had. In we're we're going to get to those. We have the questionnaire right here, Senator. Don't you worry. Oh, well, whatever. I'm just saying that you have to be the best partner in life. Okay. Government should be your partner, not your provider. If you think government is going to do everything for you, then basically, I'm sorry. I'm not going to vote that way. And I don't. I vote basically for you to have all the opportunity to be everything that you desire to be. But you've got to make an effort, too. But then then I have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to take care of those poor souls that don't have the ability, either physically or mentally, that cannot perform and function. I think that's a responsibility we have, a moral obligation. I want to ask you one more question before we get into the questionnaire, which you just jumped into, which is fine. Um, Again, you said that government should be a partner in job creation. To us, now on the Good Government Show, that sounds like good government. Um, how does that work? How do you see that working? And how do you how do you continue that? Well, let's take the Inflation Reduction Act. It's an incentivized. Okay, for years I've been hearing that I should be putting a carbon price or carbon tax on, and just be beating the, the the belittle out of the, out of the manufacturers that produce either the microphone you're talking into, <laughs> produce the table you're sitting at, or the chair you're sitting on. That how much carbon did it take to make that? And then we we'll put a tax on it. Guess what? Around the country, around the world, over in Europe especially, they never use the proceeds from the tax to figure out how to make what you're using right now with less carbon in it. We have to incentivize. That's innovate. That's innovation. That's what we're doing. So basically, government should be your partner. They have incentives. But you, you know, there's a there's a, you can't basically, I've said, you know, just like having a 40-year-old child, he says, Hey dad, where's my allowance? You're not going to make for a very productive kid if at 40 years of age, they're not making it on their own okay. or a lot sooner than that. But also, did you give them an opportunity? Did you give them an opportunity? Did you show them that there's a there's access to capital? There's risk to be taken, but you've got to perform. And I've told President, when the BBB, the Build Back Better, David, we've thrown too much, too much too quickly on, in the marketplace. This causes a lot of problems, but it's prevented us from going into a financial crisis and a health crisis. Now, with all the rest, how do we work our way out of it? You work your way out of it because you start performing. And you've got to make sure that you do that. And that's that's what it's about. So the, does government give you an opportunity and an incentive to perform? If it doesn't, then we've got a problem. All right. I could discuss these issues with you at forever. But we do have our questionnaire. And I'm going to get into it Let's right now. Let's go home quick. All right. Here we go. Uh, define good government. Good government is basically government that performs a function that does give you the opportunity of a quality of life in a democracy where you have the protection of the Constitution, no matter who you are. And the rule of law rules all of us. We're all subjected to the rule of law and be treated equally. 
How do you judge your success? What do you use as your personal yardstick for whether you're providing good government? Well, basically, let's just let's take, first of all, my miners, the coal miners in West Virginia and all over the country provided the energy for years and years. They, they, they feel like the returning Vietnam veteran. We've done everything you've asked us to do. We've done all the heavy lifting and all the dirty jobs. And now you're not welcome back. We're not good enough, smart enough or clean enough or green enough. That's ridiculous. So basically on that, I wanted to make sure they had their health care. I wanted to make sure that they had their pensions for all the hard work and sacrifices they've made. Okay, good government from that standpoint. What else in government? Basically, how do you treat your veterans? How do you treat your senior citizens? So the senior citizens to have the quality of life to be able to live in dignity after all the work they perform? Absolutely. How do you make that more adjusted to basically doing the job it was supposed to do? Don't be threatening the bejesus out of people by letting them think you're going to cut Social Security and Medicare. These are people that worked for it and earned it. If the inefficiencies, look at the inefficiencies. Don't look at the people that have gotten the reward from what their hard work has been. So government has to perform within its realm. And it's not doing that now when you're accumulating more debt faster than any time in history. And if people don't think you're living up to that standard, what should they do? The voters, the citizens. If they don't think you're living up to the, the things that you say that you're going to do, what should they do? Well, the, whole, the, the checks and balances, election box. Okay. You go, you go to the ballot box and make your decision. Is that person basically, or what's the purpose of they're there? So I've always said this. If someone's coming to you and asking you for your support and your vote and everything, if they're, if they're going through that there, David, I've said, ask a person. If they say, well, can you give me a contribution or a donation? I would tell you to tell every politician, I'm sorry. I don't give contributions and donations to political people. I am willing to make an investment, but I want to return. What should I expect from you if I vote for you? That should be your return on investment. And whether you give them one dollar or give them your vote, which is more valuable at the, at the ballot box, expect something. If a person can't tell you what they're going to try to fix and they identify the problem, I'm identifying that basically unmanaged debt will make cowards out of all of us. And it'll take us in a very, very bad position. But all that and everything that we have is the opportunity, creating opportunity here, bringing investments back, creating a good job that you can do. That's the process of government. And that's what we're trying to do. But it needs to be secured, too. You've got to secure the borders. You can't have an open border process. <laughs> OK. And you need worker and you need worker visas. You need visa workers. We need people coming here for the right reason. The same as probably your grandparent or great parent great grandparent came at some time. They came here for a better quality of life. They didn't come out here for a, a welfare check. No. They didn't come out for a handout. My great they grandfather said, came to build ships. Was, that's exactly. And mine came to basically dig coal. Okay. Um if if um if people feel like they're not getting good government, what would you like to see them do? I like to see them get involved themselves. Get more involved. Don't believe all the things that you hear and basically identifying and picking a side because you said this side's better than this side. Neither side's very good, <laughs> but I feel more comfortable on this side than I do that side. If you don't think either one are very good and you're forced to pick a side, pick another side. Force them back to the central, middle. Make sure that how you operate your life. You might be extreme one way and extreme one way in thinking, but I guarantee you, when you make that final decision for you and your family, you'll come back to the sensible middle to try to do something rational. That's just where the, that's where the country succeeds in being that stable middle. So you've been a state legislator. You've been a secretary of state, a governor, a senator. Um, what would you like people to know about the inside of government and how government works? I really truly believe that people come for the right reason. But they're basically rewarded for bad behavior once they get here. So the crazier things they do or the more extreme things are going to their respective corners, they seem to have people there that support that and start sending them finances or give them more verbal support. Yeah. The bottom line is you should be demanding more from the person that you send here for the purpose they came. And if you don't hold them accountable, next, uh, here's the thing, David, I'm not going to get involved in any of my senator's elections. So I, I am not a threat to any Democrat or Republican up here. OK, I do not give money just because a Republican friend of mine is up for reelection as a Democrat. They expect me to write a check to whoever is running against my Republican friend in their state. I won't do that. But that's not the way this place works. So you've got people now that you're supposed to be working with that might have come to your state and campaigned against you, might have written checks, yeah. might have gone out, maybe even ca campaign ads against you and then come back 
and they're supposed to sit down on Monday and work through a process that makes it better, and you're going to get credit for it after you beat the living bejesus out of me, that doesn't happen. That's just not human nature, Dave. And that's what I keep telling them. Well, government can be slow. Government can be messy. What should people know about how government works? Government's supposed to be slow, and it is messy, okay? (laughs) It's called the most deliberate form. But but there's Democrats right today that that have been threatening and wanting to get rid of the filibuster. You get rid of the filibuster, Dave, and you've lose, lose democracy that was intended by the founding fathers that designed this great country of ours and the politics that have evolved. And only thing I would tell you, if you want to know how a filibuster was intended, even though it's not written anywhere, there's yeah. no laws or rules, nothing in the Constitution. Can you figure out when they basically said, we're going to have two forms, we're going to have two houses. We're going to have the House of Representatives, which is the people. Every yep. two years, you're out there among the people figuring what they need. And then you're going to have the upper house, which is the Senate, that has a longer, more stable term. But the bottom line is, can someone had to go at some time in the 1780s and tell, especially when we formed this government, can you imagine Tom, Thomas Jefferson or George Washington going to tell the legislators and the higher ups in Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and say, guess what, guys, we've got a new form of government and it's called a republic. And they asked Benjamin Franklin, what do we have? We have a republic, uh, if you can keep it. Well, the bottom line was someone had to tell those big, bad states. But guess what? There's 13 of you. And guess what? Delaware and Rhode Island's going to have exactly the same representation that you have. Wait a minute. I'm Massachusetts. I'm I'm at the the heart of everything. And you're going to give little Delaware the same veto power that I have? Yep. We're not going to let the big boys beat up on the little guys. We're all in this. It's called the United States, not the divided states. And that's the way intention. That means that every senator can speak un, unreal, as long as they want to. There's unencumbered. And the bottom line is that turned into the filibuster that stops being run over. And then it turned into okay. the 67 vote threshold, then the 60. That Because that's the most stable form of government in the world. It doesn't flip flop back and forth every time you get someone who's in the majority, simple majority. And we're not going to have these super majorities the way this country's divided, Dave. So who's your political hero? John Kennedy and my uncle, A. James. Your, I'm sorry, your uncle? I have an uncle, A. James, who was the most retail politician I ever met in my life. What did he do? But also he was involved with him and, him and the Kennedys. He, he campaigned for the Kennedys back in the 60s. And that's when my family got very much involved. I think West Virginia was the state that carried John Kennedy to the presidency. Is that correct? West Virginia gave him the gateway to the presidency because basically the political uh, political powers of the time were saying that the Catholic can't win and become president. Right. And I'll never forget, I'm watching television one night as a young boy, 12, 13 years of age. And I, I'm, and my mother had a little, we had a little black and white television that said that it might, it might have been Walter Cronkite. It <laughs> said that if John Kennedy becomes president, then the Pope will run the country. And I looked at my mom and I said, Mom, they don't know the Catholics we know. <laughs> All right. So I have been to West Virginia. I have had a few meals there. Uh, what is your favorite West Virginia dish? Oh, my. You have to understand. That's, it's, 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 I come from an Italian family that had the greatest cooks. Good. Uh, my great grandmother. I'm in Brooklyn uh, right now. So let's talk. Okay. Let's talk and, my grand, and my grandmother, Mama Kay. And right now, my granddaughter, Kelsey Kirby, who's opened up. And, and 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 basically in honor of my grandmother, it's called Mama Kay's. The best okay. spaghetti, and the old traditional meals that we all grew up with, she's now offering them. Where's Mama Kay's? Where's in, Mama Kay's? And it's in uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. In Morgantown. Star City. Uh-huh. All right. And it's a wonderful, it's been open for about a month. You ever get there, call her. All She'll right. take care of you in fine style, but it's the greatest. Carry out Italian food or eat in whatever you want. I she can, has I can tell her you sent me, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You let me know you're coming and she'll take care of me. <laughs> okay. So Italian food is my favorite. All right. Is there is there a, 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 a regional West Virginia dish that you're fond of? Well, you know what? I just last night had our, our famous pepperoni rolls with all the sauce and trimmings and pepperoni in them and the cheese and the sauces. And it was that was my dinner last night. And I've all been right. craving that for a while. So that's that's always a good one. So you said when you were a kid, you watched uh your family uh, get John Kennedy elected when growing up, was this something you aspire to? Did you want to be president no. yourself? Never. I never wanted to get involved in politics. I watched my uncle from afar and I watched all the people and my, and my dad and all of them were very much involved. But, uh, uh, 
you know, b- behind the scenes. My mom, my dad and my f- grandfather were both mayors of our little town, but there's only four or 500 people. So it's a very small thing, but they thought they just had to contribute and give something back. Okay. So I've always been, in, I've always been instilled in me. This is a great opportunity in the greatest country on earth. We have got to make sure that we do everything we can to keep it that way. You have to be involved. So I was always involved, but up until 35 years of age is when I ran the first time. I okay. already had three children by that time. I was not intending to go down the political road. And then suddenly, here you are. And then suddenly, once I got involved, I was one of 100 in the House of Delegates. I figured if I ran for the state Senate, I'd be one of 34. I could help three times as many people. If I become governor, I'd be one of one. I could really make a difference. And God, that was the greatest job I've ever had in my life. Because every day I got up, I could make someone's life better. And I didn't want to go to bed at night because I thought I'm going to miss something. I could have helped more people. And then I become in the Senate and it goes backwards again. And now here you are in a process that's just slower than Moses. But when you do something right and you can help millions and millions of people, and we were able to do that with what we helped all of our minors and pensions and things of that sort in our health care, you're able to do something that really can affect the whole world in the okay. U.S. Senate. What but, takes the patience? Takes the patience of Joe. But Governor, you thought was the best job. Best job I've ever had. Really? But I'm more of an executive minded person. I, I want to think, you, you come to me and you, you said, Joe, help me. And I said, David, sure, I can help you. I can do that. Well, and you, would, I can do it. Would you like to announce your candidacy for president? <laughs> now, I'm going to be any, anywhere I can help my country be, be the country that, that has given me the opportunities. I'm going to do everything I can to help it. So let's bring it back to good government. Give me an example of a good government project that you've done for West Virginia or for the, for the, the nation. Well, basically, in West Virginia, what we were able to do, you're talking about right now as a senator or as yeah. a governor? No, right now as a senator. First of all, let me just tell you, as a governor, I'll, I'll give you that, okay? Sure. I, I'm a governor, brand new governor. In 2006, we have the Sago Mine Disaster. And my goodness, I've been around mine disasters all my life. And there was so much that could be and should have been done to protect more miners, and it wasn't done. And two weeks later, we have another one at Aracoma, and then in 2009... We shut all the mines down. We went through safety inspections and start changing basically how do we save lives. And these people who are so courageous that are basically produ- producing the energy the country needs, how can we make sure that when they go to work, their families don't have to worry about them coming home? We made tremendous strides and changes in that. And, and I felt good about that because I knew that our goal was this. I can't tell you. I can tell you how much a continuous miner cost, a piece of equipment cost. I can't tell you the price of a miner cost. They're priceless. So sure. once we got every company understanding, you cannot replace the human being that runs the machinery that you know you can buy for X amount of dollars. You better do everything you can. So how we did, I try to get a mentality that if a miner is responsible, if a miner basically says this is unsafe conditions and I should not be here, nor should my fellow workers, they had the ability to pull the plug and shut it down. And we gave them a, a, a private line to call in if they were forced and doing something that was unsafe okay. so we could follow up to make sure they were in a safe condition. That's manufacturing, that's mining and everything. Those are That's good government. That helps basically put the perspective of what needs to be done. And then the little things, we've done things, whether we're highway, when I was governor, I made them make sure in West Virginia, we put every berm we could because we're going between mountains and on the side of mountains. We need roadways where people can ride a bike or walk or whatever, and we tried to widen the roadways. That's a little thing, but it's conscious enough to think, hey, that's a lot safer than what we've had, and it's a lot better for us. So just those types of things, but also the most important thing during the, the shutdown of 2.8 and 2.9, when I say the financial collapse of the banks, yep, we were rated one of the best, one of the top three in the nation as far as how we fiscally managed our uh, money. And we did that and raised our credit rating and everything else because I made sure the fiscal responsibility was something that I knew that people would take uh, take great uh, heed in, if you will, and coming to the state knowing their money wasn't going to be wasted. And basically, we've done that, and I continue to try to carry that. I got a lot of work to do on that here. To, in the, you know, I, and I asked my grandfather, this was a good one. I said, hey, Papa, <laughs> what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans? I was a young kid. Right. He said, oh, Joe, he said, I'll tell you, not a whole lot. He said, if you put a pal of, of tax money in a, in a table, they'll both spend it all. Now, the Republicans will feel bad about it, but I'll tell you, they'll spend it all, both of them. And he was so right. And that was 60 years ago he told me that. Okay? <laughs> so it's true today as it was then. 
I just want to ask you one more question. I ask everyone in West Virginia this. When was the last time you were on your ATV? Oh, my goodness. I rode the ATV. I went to Hatfield McCoy Trail and done that. And I'm on an ATV back. We have every chance I get. We have it at the house. We have, everybody has ATVs. What do you mean? I, well, I did not know that until I started talking to people in West Virginia. So we all have ATVs. I know. We all I, have I asked ATVs. your wife. I said, where are you? Or she goes, oh, well, they're in the That's garage. our second car. They're in the garage. We still have <laughs> Senator, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, best to your wife. And uh, I hope to meet you sometime down in West Virginia. Thank you, Dave. Please come. You're welcome anytime. And go to Mama Cage. Mama Cage. Kelsey will take care of you. Will do. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Bye-bye. The Good Government Show is sponsored by OurCo. That means our community. OurCo has found a way to make government even more effective. OurCo provides a platform that blends in-person and digital interactions, and that connects people with their government. Their mobile app transforms meaningful conversations into reliable data, and the result is actionable insights that inspires a positive change. It's sort of like having a flashpole. Do you want to know if the community would rather have a dog park or a bike trail? Arco can get you an answer immediately from the folks in your community. With Arco, you can engage your citizens or any group, learn what they want, and build programs and policies that advance your county, your job creators, and your constituents. So visit OurCo.com, that's O-U-R-C-O.com, and learn how they do it. And while you're there, book a demonstration. That was my conversation with West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. As you heard, his ATV is his second car. See, I continue to learn a lot about the folks in West Virginia. And this time, he mentioned the Hatfields and McCoy trails, not me. But a good discussion about government, a little government history, and his deep ties to West Virginia, and a short lesson on the filibuster. Best of all, I got a good tip on a good Italian in West Virginia at Mama K's in Morgantown. So overall, a very informative conversation with Senator Joe Manchin. Join us again right here where you listen to podcasts. This is The Good Government Show. Join us next time for another conversation with another leader in government. I'm Dave Martin. Thanks for listening. The Good Government Show and a conversation with is produced by Valley Park Productions. Jim Ludlow, David Martin, and David Snyder are the executive producers. Our editor and producer is Jason Sturchik. This is The Good Government Show. Thanks for listening.